Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to another one of my uh, passionate rants about uh, a, a comic book series and or movie, uh, or just TV in general. I've done these about other shows before, but lately it's primarily been comic book shows that I've watched. Um, uh, just started uh, watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. with a friend of mine who has never seen them before, and it's been years since I watched the early episodes. And uh, I tell you what, that show is a lot better binging than it was waiting a week in between. Things make a lot of sense, and some of the stories feel a lot more congealed um, than I remember them. Uh, except for that one episode where the guy is trapped between dimensions. That episode can completely be skipped harms nothing. But anyway, that's beside the point. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the latest, or at least the latest that I've seen series in the new Marvel television universe, uh, Cloak and Dagger. Um, let's see, and before I start that, hello to the chat, thoughts from the dryer, Car uh, Corey Suzuki, sorry about that, Stargazer Nuts, and Emperor W.R. Costin, hello. Um, so Cloak and Dagger are uh, sort of like Guardians of the Galaxy, they are known elements in the Marvel Universe of comic books, but they're not like major A-list stars. They're like C-grade sort of characters. Um, kind of a cool concept. They had their own series for quite a while. I don't know if they do now. I'm only going off of like sort of the original um, uh, comic books, a collection of which I own. Um, hello, K. Rosering. Um, so... This, sort of like Guardians of the Galaxy, they could take these characters and kind of do pretty much anything they wanted to with them without really conflicting with like some hardcore fan base that would like point out a whole bunch of problems and things. And I'm not a hardcore Cloak and Dagger fan. So overall, save for the basics I knew about the characters from their opening issues of their comic book series, um, I didn't come into this with any like you know, great expectations, so to speak, that I would have my heart broken if they didn't do X or if they didn't show Y or whatever. Um, but that being said, the show was exceedingly disappointing. Now, my first thought was there's only 10 episodes. And if you have listened to my other Marvel TV series uh, rants, you'll know that one of my major complaints about some of the Netflix series is they have... Um, a story arc that they focus on almost uh, obsessively without having any sort of episodic um, events. Uh, and that story arc could fill up, in most cases, six or eight episodes. But then they have to stretch it in a 13, or in the case of the CW, sometimes 22 or 23 episodes. So when I saw there was only 10 episodes to this, I, I thought, okay, well, they can tell an origin story in a relatively concise uh, framework and not have a whole lot of filler. Boy, was I wrong. Um, and, you know, supremely disappointed. Uh, so as a little primer, for those of you that might not know much about Cloak and Dagger, this is the basics. And I'm going straight off of the original comic book series in which they were introduced. There have been variations and uh, retcons of some of their details in the time since but uh, this comic book came out in the 80s, and uh, so this was the gist. Uh, you had uh, two kids from different sides of the track, so to speak, who were runaways. You had Tandy Bowen, who came from uh, wealth and privilege, and you had Tyrone Johnson, who was sort of an urban, blue-collar family kid. And they both ran away from home, or depending on the telling, they you know got away from home for some reason or another. Um, they were effectively kidnapped by, at the time, sort of an unnamed entity, which later on was defined. But anyway, they were kidnapped and used as guinea pigs for experimental drugs, uh, along with a whole bunch of other kids that had been kidnapped, street kids. And of all the kids that had been experimented on, they were the two that survived. And these drugs they were given uh, somehow manifested in them powers, superpowers, complementary superpowers. Now, Tyrone uh, effectively became a living portal to the dark dimension and its powers. And if you know anything about the dark dimension from 
um, the Marvel Universe, it's essentially a dimension where all the shadow stuff comes from. So uh, I believe it's the dimension that technically Nightcrawler moves through when he teleports. Same thing for Cloak. He can teleport using the dark dimension. But he's also like a physical, he can create essentially a physical portal to the dark dimension through his cloak where his body sort of disappears and he's just like uh, a gateway into the dark dimension. Uh, whereas Tandy Bowen, she became imbued with this sort of pure living light energy, the ability to generate it um, and pass it on to others in different ways. Now, the thing about this relationship in the comic books, Cloak's curse was that he was essentially a, a vampire, okay? He needed to feed on living energy, on living people. And in the original comic books, he essentially would absorb people and feed off of their light energy as they were essentially transported to the dark dimension to suffer in the cold and the dark for their sins kind of thing. Um, Cloak was kind of a punisher figure after a fashion. However, he was struggling with his humanity against the urges and the hunger that the dark dimension was, you know, uh, requiring of him. Now, Tandy Bowen's powers, her ability to generate sort of living life force energy, um, she could sate his hunger for a time by basically giving her her light energy which was, after a fashion, her own life energy. She couldn't do it forever, you know. Uh, she could recuperate over time and then, you know, sort of keep him uh, sated. And that's sort of how their relationship was. It was really kind of a uh, destructive relationship. It was sort of like, um, you know, a drug addict and an enabler after a fashion. It made for a really weird kind of dynamic between the two because uh, she was beholden to him because he saved her life in the escape from the guys who experimented on them. And so she felt obligated to stick with him and help him through his curse, basically. Now, uh, Tandy's powers were that she could form these basically energy bolts called light daggers. And they did various things depending on what she decided to do with them. She could uh, throw them at people and then stun them conceivably kill them by sort of uh, overloading their, their bodily senses with it. Um, she could use this light energy to cleanse people of their addictions. Like if she found somebody high on heroin, she could cleanse their body of the, all the poisons in them and effectively give them a second chance to sort of live a, a better life. And there was some uh, implication that uh, when she threw a dagger into somebody, uh, they could conceivably... Um, see visions of the life they could lead if they change their ways kind of thing. And that might influence them to change their behavior. The other thing that she could do was she could use her light energy to try to heal people, like injuries and stuff like that. And at least in the original comics, she attempted, but was not successful, to bring someone back from the dead, an innocent who had been killed in the process of things. Uh, but for the most part, Cloak and Dagger in the beginning were very sort of dark, gritty, vigilantes who did not hesitate to kill for the most part if they felt necess it was necessary, but Dagger was more hesitant to. She would at least try to give people a chance to surrender before she did anything that would be permanent or overly damaging. That's kind of the gist of how that worked in the comic books. Um, and they were set in New York. There was a much, uh, there was a religious overtone to the thing because they sought sanctuary in a church with a priest there who was trying to sort of help the local community and help drug addicts and people get out of crime and that kind of thing. Uh, but there was another aspect to these two characters. Besides the fact that they had these powers, it was almost as if, and especially in the case of Cloak, that beyond simply being human beings with powers, they were almost acting as though they were more vessels for a greater power. Like Cloak was an avatar of darkness and vengeance. And whereas um, Tandy was an avatar of light and cleansing. Now, of course, both of those things can be used for different purposes, good and evil, depending on the situation. But that was kind of the thing. They were almost half themselves and half this force that was uh, inside them. Okay. There's your primer on Cloak and Dagger in the comic books. The TV show. Um, they changed a lot about the origin story in the TV show. Um, 
And first was the setting. It's not in New York, it's in New Orleans, which is kind of cool because New Orleans has a lot of character and I thought it was kind of an interesting setting. I don't think any of the other TV shows uh, or movies have really used New Orleans as a setting yet. And I thought it was kind of cool because there's a lot of mystery there, there's a lot of history. And they dwell on that history a bit in the show, much to the detriment of the narrative, I think, but we'll get there. Um, so I've got a, a list of notes and things. And like before in the, my other reviews, I'm not going to go episode by episode reviewing each one individually. I'm going to give you my overall impressions of the show, the individual characters, and then certain events in there that I took exception to, or overall sort of themes and things that didn't quite work. Now, before I begin, though, I do have to say, the people playing Cloak and Dagger, the two actress, uh, actors, uh, Aubrey... I only remember their first names for some reason, Aubrey and Olivia. Uh, they did a really good job. I really like watching them play their characters, okay? Some of the things that their characters did were overwrought, over melodramatic, and really ham-fisted in the delivery. But that aside, they did a great job. I really liked watching them even if what they were doing or being made to do in certain situations was kind of painful to have to sit through. Um, yeah, everybody in this show overall as, as actors did a good job. I didn't really have any like situation where I thought that's you know, horrible acting or something. Um, it more came down to the writing and uh, the characterization of some things. So that's, that's first and foremost. Um, my overall sense after watching the whole series, uh, like the Netflix series, this is a sort of down-to-earth-ish, more gritty, darker comic book setup. However, unlike the Netflix series, and I'm even going to go as far as to say, unlike Iron Fist and Jessica Jones, my two least favorite series on Netflix, this one was more painful to watch. And here's why. It was grimdark. It was very Nolanized, you know. Um, but there was no comic relief, okay? I mean, I can handle Daredevil if you've got a foggy or if you've got some wry humor coming out of uh, Matthew Murdock or The Priest, that kind of stuff. There's got to be some relief. Uh, so far as I can recall, there was no relief in this thing. Uh, the show was mopey and joyless, and uh, it, it, it played out less like a graphic novel than it did reading some emo teenager's personal journal of woe is me half the time. A lot of this show is teen drama, family drama, a lot of angst and depression and stuff. And given the characters' origin stories, some of that is justified. I'm not going to say that, you know, uh, every scene where they're you know, uh, fretting over what's going on in their lives and everything was, was, you know, not meant to be there or shouldn't have been there. It's just that everything was like that all the way through. And even, and I'll get there, but even at the point at which you would think things are resolved, oh, no, we can't have our characters actually resolve anything. We have to reset, we have to hit the reset button like halfway through a 10 episode show to not let our characters advance at all. And like I say, I'll get there. But first of all, let me go back to the chat real quick. Hello, Heroic Nico. Hello, Satsu. Uh, hello, Kukin1928. Peter Hades313, the Peter. Hello, the Peter. Your Conscience, hello. Midnight Ex in Exile, hello. Um, I don't know, did I miss anybody else? Let me scroll up real quick. Skeptok, hello. Uh, I think Mr. Shadow, hello, if you're still watching. Mr. Shadow, appropriate for Cloak. Okay, so first and foremost, the first ep first two episodes, the introductory episodes, which I understand was like a, a two-hour movie special event when this first premiered, are actually pretty good. Um, the origin story is changed in this way. Uh, it's set in New Orleans, and on a particular night, years and years ago, when both Tandy and Tyrone were... I'm going to say, I think they were like six, six or seven years old, in that range, relatively young. Um, on the same night, they both have the greatest tragedy of their lives happen, um, which is caused directly and indirectly, I suppose, on a single unifying event. So 
to put it shortly, because I could go on forever. Uh, Tyrone, little Tyrone, um, is trying to emulate his brother and his brother's friends by stealing a car stereo. Okay, his brother Billy, who is not trying to lead that life or trying to put that kind of behavior behind him, takes the radio from him and they're gonna go take it back to the owner and try to undo this wrong that Tyrone has done. Uh, as a consequence of this, though, uh, they happen to be caught by a passing police cruiser who just see a older black teenager holding a disconnected car radio in a neighborhood that I assume, because of the way they set it up, this kind of thing is, you know, what happens. And so they get cornered, and Billy is standing on the edge of a dock for some reason. I think he was trying to run away or thinking he was going to jump off the dock or something, so he's standing there. I'm going to pause there, jump over to Tandy. Tandy Bowen is, a uh, at the time, uh, a little girl who who is a uh, daughter of a uh, oil company executive, Roxxon Corporation. And if you know Marvel Comics, you know Roxxon is sort of like the um, Pentex of the Marvel Universe, if you know the World of Darkness. And I'm just going to be a nerd here. But anyway, it's the evil corporation. Um, and she's a ballerina at a young age. She is effectively living in a uh, uh, upper upper middle class uh, lifestyle, and she's in the back seat of her of the car with her father as he's driving her home from ballet practice, and he's on the phone talking to somebody, trying to warn them about the dangers going on at an oil platform, which just happens to be off the coast of where they're sitting or wh where they're on the freeway. Okay, now as Dad is calling and trying to warn the oil platform of the dangers of whatever's going on there. And as Billy is standing on the edge of the dock being, uh, uh, having guns drawn on him by the cops, the oil platform explodes, okay? And that explosion does a couple of things. First, it makes the cop, it makes one of the cops holding a gun on Billy flinch essentially and shoot Billy twice, sort of like he thought that there was a gunshot because he thought maybe there was something in somebody else's hand or there was someone else around. So Billy gets shot twice and is killed, falls into the water. Uh, over on the bridge, uh, Dad uh, on the freeway gets distracted by his phone call and then the explosion just off in the distance of the uh, pipeline or the, uh, the platform, and he veers off and crashes into the water. Okay, now Tyrone goes jumping after his brother Billy into the water. And Tandy is in the backseat of this car as it's slowly sinking into... Um, of the bay or whatever. And then so dad's dead, Billy's dead, Tyrone somehow in the course of looking for Billy finds Tandy's car sinking. Now, as the two of them are sort of coming together and he's trying to save her, there's a second explosion at the oil platform and you see this energy wave burst out in a big uh, circle going through the water and it hits both kids, okay? Um, Tyrone manages to save um, Tandy uh, by grabbing her hand and pulling her to safety. They end up washed up on a beach, and then Tandy sort of wakes up first, and she just kind of runs away, taking his uh, hoodie with her, and he ends up waking up and finding one of her ballet shoes. And then we're basically told they never see each other again until they're both uh, in late high school age. Okay, so 18, 19, whatever. Now, I didn't have a problem with that change in the origin story because it's like, okay, you know, whatever. I wasn't tied to like they had to be drug experiments or something. But um, how that event gave them powers and also did some other things to some other people doesn't make a lot of sense. I understand comic book show, yes, but there's differing explanations for what's going on here. Either way, we find them uh, eventually uh, in different situations. Tandy, after her dad died, her dad was blamed for the oil platform explosion. All their family's wealth has been essentially wiped out. Mom's now an alcoholic living in some trailer park somewhere. And Tandy is now a con artist. She seduces rich men up to their hotel rooms or their apartments or whatever. She drugs them until they go to sleep, then she robs them. That's her life now. And she hides out in an abandoned church. Uh, in the middle of New Orleans, I guess. Uh, she has a boyfriend slash partner who's sort of like her partner in crime. 
Uh, he loves her totally and is a good guy, save for being the fact that he's a, a thief. And uh, Tandy's, you know, sort of a, a broken, uh, conflicted individual. Uh, Tyrone, on the other hand, he lives in a sort of upper middle class situation. His mother is the breadwinner. She's uh, some business executive. His father, I'm not quite sure what his father does. He is there. Um, and they both blame Tyrone halfwise for what happened to Billy, but they're also super overprotective of Tyrone on the off chance that something happens to him. Now, Tyrone told his parents a cop shot Billy. And they went to the police station and said a cop shot Billy, this red-haired cop with a scar on his face. He shot Billy to death. He killed him. But the cop at the station at the time of the killing said, there's no such cop here. I don't know what you're talking about. So ever since his parents have believed, or so far as he knows, that uh, 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 Tyrone was making it up or saw something or just imagined it or whatever, and Billy was killed in some kind of gang thing and they haven't caught his killer, but it wasn't a cop. But Tyrone knows the truth. So the real killer of Billy has gotten away all these years. Um, and uh, Tandy's dad is dead. And he was basically like the best dad in the world. Um, he was her hero. And she misses him. And her mother's turned into an alcoholic, uh, promiscuous sort of uh, waste, waitress kind of thing. OK, well, these two worlds collide when they both end up at the same sort of outdoor party one night. And Tandy steals Tyrone's wallet. Tyrone chases Tandy into a graveyard. Ooh, more, more uh, religious uh, iconography there. And uh, they end up touching. And then suddenly there's a burst of energy. And then their powers kind of manifest. Uh, Tyrone's got shadows coming off his hand. And, and Tandy's got big bright light coming out of her hand. They don't know what's going on. Uh, that, that's essentially, I mean, there's other things going on there. But that's essentially the setup. And it wasn't bad. I kind of liked it. I mean, I always like origin stories. Origin stories are kind of easy to do, at least the first few steps, because there's a sort of a mystery to it. You're not quite sure what's going on. It's the discovery of someone's powers, that kind of thing. So I was curious, like, okay, well, where and when does he get the cloak? When does that happen? And, uh, you know, when does he suddenly get this hunger that he's got to feed off of people? Uh, he doesn't. Uh, that aspect to Cloak's character never comes up. He has no hunger. Um, uh, when, when does Tandy, you know, heal somebody's wound? Like she finds a, a dog hit by a car and goes up to it and is all sad and suddenly the dog's fine. That never happens. She never heals anybody, or at least not in a physical sense. Um, what are these two's major powers? Well, <laughs> it's not being superheroes. Um, it's not fighting bad guys, per se. It's being psychics. Now, I have no idea why they did this, but they dwelled on this a lot. Now, you know, I should back up a little bit. Let me back up just a little bit before I get there. There, there are four primary characters that drive the plot of the story. Obviously, you've got Tyrone Johnson and you've got Tandy Bowen. The other two characters are... I guess the villain of the story. I mean, technically, there are two villains. You've got the corporation Roxxon, which is kind of manipulating things and also doing horrible things. And then you've kind of got Connors, and I guess, oh, sorry, Connors was the police officer that killed Billy. But Connors doesn't exist anymore somehow. Um, nobody knows who he is, even though he's about as distinctive as you could ask for, a redhead with a giant scar on his cheek. Somehow, all these years, he's never been found or discovered, and, and uh, Tyrone's uh, claim has never been proven. Um, and then you have uh, Bridget O'Reilly. And Bridget O'Reilly is a character from the original comic books. And she's a police detective, uh, in, in, in this case, the New Orleans Police Department. And she ends up becoming sort of an ally of Cloak and Dagger. Although they're, they're never called those names in the, the TV show, which, you know, again, it's fine. Um, but... So after Tandy and Tyrone run into each other, they go their separate ways again for a time. And uh, these characters don't make a lot of sense. All right, Tandy and Tyrone sort of have the same thing played out throughout the entire series. Tandy is a broken girl. She doesn't trust anybody. She runs away from good things. She's scared of getting attached to people because they, she might lose them like her dad. Uh, Tyrone, on the other hand, 
He's uh, trying to reconcile all this anger and guilt he has in him over the death of his brother. He doesn't understand why his parents act the way they do. Uh, he's got a lot of hatred for police and distrust of authority and that kind of thing, although he's the good boy and does all the good things. A lot of the motivations of these two characters are relatable, okay? I mean, they are. They're just used far too much and overplayed in the show. That's why I kind of like the characters and I appreciate the acting, but they repeat the same trials and tribulations every episode. It's like, yes, we know already. After about the fourth episode, I was like, okay, we get it. Tandy is a mess. Tyrone is guilty, feels guilty. I, I get it. Okay, we can we move on to some other stuff with with the establishment that we know that this is what's driving these two characters. Um, so when uh, the the powers first manifest in two sort of intense situations, Tyrone, and and this is also part of the confusing thing. The the mechanics of these powers don't make a lot of sense in the story. Uh, Tyrone's major power in this, aside from the shared power between the two of them, which I'll get to in a minute and is manifested way more than it should, Tyrone's major power is teleportation. He can essentially, as far as, you know, for the sake of things without it, the show explaining it, he can zip through the dark dimension from one point to another quickly. Uh, he can do it like from in, in five feet in front of him to another spot in within line of sight, or somehow subconsciously he can teleport across the city. How he does this, why he does this, we don't know. And we're never told. He always tends to subconsciously teleport himself to someplace significant. But how that works, never explained. And the most inexplicable part of it is, all this time, Tyrone has never been able to find the red-headed cop with the scar. He has no idea. He's been told his entire life he doesn't exist. He's even doubting his own memories at certain points. And yet... The night after he, uh, man he touches Tandy Bowen and their powers sort of like spark off, somehow he subconsciously teleports himself to the redheaded cop with the scar. How? Why? Don't know. I mean, if it was something like, you know how Ghost Rider, for those of you that know Ghost Rider, Ghost Rider, the spirit of vengeance, he can kind of sense when innocent blood has been spilt. And that's when the Ghost Rider sort of like, you know, bubbles up inside of Danny Ketch or uh, Johnny Blaze or whoever whoever has the spirit at the time. If if Cloak's power to teleport was like a, a reflexive, like I'm going to teleport to the greatest evil, or I'm going to teleport, I'm I'm thinking of something really intensely. I'm thinking of a situation, or I'm thinking of uh, I have a picture of someone in my mind, and I'm going to teleport to that person subconsciously or consciously. That'd be kind of cool. Like I'm thinking of a bad guy. I've seen a villain. I'm going to find him or find out something about him. And then just like the dark force, whatever sort of takes him to a clue or something. Like that. That'd be kind of cool. That never really happens except in the situation of the cop, kind of. And we never really understand why or how. It's never really used again in that fashion. So I don't know. Uh, Tandy's powers manifest for the first time after she is cornered by one of her victims. One of the guys that she robbed tracked her down and he and a couple friends pull her into an alley and then this guy attempts to rape her. And in the process of trying to do that, she suddenly manifests a light dagger. Um, real quick, thank you, Pumpkin Trucker. Just got here, are we talking about that crappy movie from the 80s, the imagery, the imaginary super spy and the kid? No, no, we are not talking about the classic film Cloak and Dagger starring Dabney Coleman, the classic film, not that crappy movie, the classic film, crappy movie. Ha! Huh. That movie creeped me out as a kid. It was great. It was the first movie that ever introduced me to the idea of tabletop role-playing games. So I don't know what you're talking about, Pumpkin Trucker. In fact, I'm going to bring that up at movies you should have watched sometimes. I got a copy of that on DVD around here somewhere. How dare you? No, no, no. <laughs> now we're talking about the uh, TV series of the comic book characters. So uh, Tandy manifests a light dagger, but this light dagger, or these light daggers, they're not bolts of energy, okay? They're not things that could conceivably stun someone, 
um, or, or light that she's controlling. They are essentially manifested physical daggers that can cut through anything, solid steel, with just a whiff of her hand. They're basically like conjured adamantium. And she stabs the guy. Okay. Now, obviously, she didn't know she was doing this. In this instance, she was just acting on reflex. But I was taken aback, honestly, when I saw blood on the blade. I thought that it would show her holding, like, the light dagger in his, like, chest. But it was effectively, like, phased into him or, like, giving him a shock or something. No, this just does physical damage. And I was really surprised. I was like, that's a lot more gruesome than the comic books. Now, in the comic books, it's left a little ambiguous in places whether or not her light daggers kill people. Um, according to other sources, she can control the intensity of the daggers as to whether they will stun or conceivably kill. So it's not like it's completely out the realm of possibility uh, or out of the realm of the established canon that her daggers could kill someone and hurt them. But the fact that all they do is destroy, all they do is stab, was really surprising to me, given that cloak, sorry, Dagger's whole thing was sort of cleansing light, healing, um, uh, sort of reluctant violence, or violence meant to cleanse the world of bad things, um, but not necessarily to kill. Um, so that was, that was really odd. Um, so, but that's, that's not their main powers. Okay, teleportation. Uh, eventually, Cloak is able to absorb someone into the dark dimension, presumably. We'll get to that. And use sort of dark shadow tendrils to grab people. That happens once, and we'll get to that too. Uh, but mainly, it's just teleporting to places, and uh, Tandy makes daggers appear that can cut anything. No healing powers. Maybe that'll come season two. I don't know. But either way, their main powers are psychic ones. And we spend so much time in this show going through the psychic stuff. Okay, so what can these psychic powers do? Well, Tandy can touch someone's skin and see their hopes. She can see basically a, a manifestation of their, their greatest hopes for themselves. And whereas Tyrone touches someone and they, he sees their greatest fears, like their core sort of uh, 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 lizard brain sort of fear or trauma from their past or something. And they do this all the time. We go through so many instances of them using this psychic power to see what's in people's thoughts or get an idea of their character or, or see their fear, fears and how you could possibly exploit them. Uh, we spend an entire episode with the two of them running around inside a cat catatonic's head when they both touch the guy at the same time and sort of live in his memories or live in his mind for a while. Um, that episode was kind of interesting, but they use this thing all the time. And so we're always teleported to some forest where they see, you know, the forest of the mind and somebody's stuff. And they're not doing any superhero things. You know, they're just like doing these little play acts and little vignettes of trauma and and dreams and things and the uh, disappointments and oh god it's just so depressing and my like, god after about three or four episodes i wanted to slip my wrist every time i finished a show because i was like oh this is so sad but anyway we also find out that they can, they can apparently manipulate their fears or their hopes while they're inside their head they have to be physically touching them though of course and we also find out that Tandy can destroy their hopes. Okay, she can go into somebody's head and just like erase their hopes, effect effectively take all hope out of their life. And when she disconnects from them, they're a much sadder, darker person. And she does this a couple of times. And I'm like, yeah, superhero show, destroying the hopes and dreams of people around you that have done nothing wrong to you. Yeah. Superhero show. I mean, Tyrone manipulating someone's fears to make them like back off and stop doing the things that they're doing. That's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, I was like, why are we supposed to like Tandy again? Tyrone's the most sympathetic character. 
I mean, he was done wrong by not only the cops and the system and his parents, but Tandy is like, okay, accident took her dad away and circumstances kind of fell apart. And yeah, she's kind of a victim of the corporation kind of thing, but everything else was her choice to become an asshole. Don't like her. And maybe that's part of the point. You know, you're supposed to see a redemptive story. Yeah, but you don't. You don't. Because even after, even after Tandy eventually finds a way to get revenge on the company, to clear her father's name, she gets the evidence, the information necessary to clear her father's name of fault in the, uh, in the platform explosion that killed people and cost tons of money and everything. Well, she sees a memory inside her mother's head. And we find out that her rosy image of her father isn't rosy. He was actually a wife beater, but mom never told her. And we immediately hit the reset button. And this is about like six or seven episodes into the show. So we've spent the bulk of the show going through these things where Tyrone's trying to solve his, his brother's murder. Tandy's trying to clear her father's name. They both effectively get to the point where they kind of do it, especially Tandy. And then we hit the reset button because now everything that she had been fighting for was bullshit. Yeah, she cleared his name or tried to, but he's actually an asshole. So fuck that. And now I'm going to be on a self-destructive streak again because everything that I put my life into doesn't matter. I was like, why would you do that, writers? Why would you give a sucker punch to this? Why can't the characters advance? Why can't they have a win? I mean, every episode is like a failure. Every episode, they're having to be going backwards. And then you get to the point where it's like, they finally win. No, we can't have them win. Not even in this, we can't have them win. So we got to go backwards. Everything gets reset. Tyrone tries to get a confession out of the cop. And the cop doesn't get convicted of anything. Uh, somehow this Connors character has control over the whole police department. And he never gets convicted of anything. And so then Tyrone turns into a rage monster and starts beating up kids at school and just about getting expelled. I, yeah, um, that, what? Uh, okay. Let me, uh, <laughs> as you can tell, I was very frustrated watching this show. Very frustrated watching this show. Um, because I wanted to like it. You know, it's one of those things where I go into these things. It's Marvel. I, I, I feel so happy to see these things that were just sort of um, a hobby and an obsession of mine when I was a kid come to fruition on the screen and see these characters brought to life. And now my phone's ringing because somebody's trying to sell me something. Um, and so I go into these things with all this sort of hope, like maybe this will be good. Maybe this will be really good. Maybe this will be Daredevil level of quality, Daredevil season one. So disappointing. Um, okay. So who is the villain of this show? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Connors, the bad cop, is technically Tyrone's villain. And he becomes mostly the villain because later on he sort of has control over the whole police department and somehow gets out of a murder confession and does a whole bunch of other things. Roxanne is also a villain, in a way, the company, led by its president or whatever, but also all its corporate drones. Um but evil corporation kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, they do bad things, really bad things, bad things that never get addressed. Okay. I know this is all over the place, but like I said, this is not a episode by episode review. I'm going to go to the chat real quick to see if anybody's asking any questions or anything before I go into my specific plot point um, problems. Uh, let's see. Data Wasteland says, got to run. See you soon. Uh, Fernando says, give Scribe some love and hit the like button. Ah, yes, guys, the like button. The like button is uh, the sort of lifeline of uh, whether or not this video gets, uh, you know, seen by others. Uh, Duck Dog says, rocks on energy. Yes, rocks on energy. Um, and this show, as far as I can tell, does take place in the same universe as the Netflix shows uh, because uh, Misty Knight's name is dropped. Stark's name, or last name is dropped, uh, Rand, Rand Corporation or Rand Industries or whatever is, is mentioned. So even though this is on Freeform, which is, I guess, an ABC, uh, other network kind of thing, 
it, it is hinted at that uh, O'Reilly, the female cop, knows Misty Knight because O'Reilly's a transplant from New York. So she knew Misty Knight back in the day. So I guess, you know, maybe Misty Knight will show up on this show. I don't know how the whole television thing works between different networks. Like, could a Netflix character show up on a freeform show? I don't know. But I guess we'll find out maybe in season two. Um, First Cynic says, when will someone do a Power Pack TV show? Hey, you know, with the right writers, they can make Power Pack a kid-friendly Marvel superhero show or, or movie. It's possible. I wouldn't recommend it. Not on TV with these guys, but it's possible. Um, Sean M says, should have bailed on it after two episodes, Scribe. Well, like I said, the first two episodes gave me sort of hope. Like, okay, this is kind of an interesting setup. It's got a bit of a mystery to it. Characters are all right. You know, I had hoped I would see more of them learning the extent of their powers. We don't really see that until really late in the game. And even then, it's it's very, very limited. Like the most we see of anybody developing their powers is Cloak. And that's only sort of like for a moment near the very end of the show. Uh, Sora Luna says, thank you, Scribe, for watching these shows so I don't have to. Well, like I say, I'm just giving a summary of stuff. If you really want to know what's going on, you have to watch the show. Because, um, I mean, I'm giving spoilers, but at the same time, I'm not giving episode by episode uh, recitation of all the events because that would take forever. Uh, Reed Terrapin says, the movie Cloak and Dagger with Dabney Coleman was one of my favorites when I was a kid. Me too. Me too. I loved it as a kid. Uh, I, I watched it a couple of years ago when I found it on DVD, and uh, I still liked it. Uh, even though the effects are cheesy, you know, it's kind of it's kind of a goofy movie. I still like it. I thought I thought Dabney Coleman gave a really good performance for what it was, you know. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Let's see if I missed anything else. Uh, okay. Uh, Hate Camel says, sounds like the villains of the show are the writers. Well, they didn't do any favors to the narrative. Okay, so there's very little superheroing in this. You only get a little bit of it like at the very end of the show. I'm talking like the last episode. But even then, it's very disjointed. So here are my main plot complaints. Okay, I've got a list of uh, just a few, few items, and then I've got some points to make at the end, and then I'll wrap this up. Okay, so Tandy's mother, the drunk... Uh, has a tendency to hook up with married men, and she's looking for, you know, uh, an enabler and everything else. And her latest catch is a lawyer named Greg, a lawyer that is helping her with her case against Roxanne to try to clear dad's name and get back the, the money, the retirement, the insurance, or whatever else that her family is owed. Uh, Greg, after Tandy touches his hand, Greg turns out to be a good guy. He turns out to be somebody that actually wants to marry her mother because he's going through a divorce with his current wife and isn't has, doesn't have any ill intent. He's not just there for the sex. He's actually has well intentions. So because she finds this out, Tandy starts working with him on the case because she knows some stuff about uh, she, she's learned some tricks of the trade being a con artist over time. And she wants to, you know, prove her dad's innocence. Um. Well, of course, as Greg digs deeper into the whole Roxxon thing, uh, Tandy goes over to his office one night to go help him out or do some work, and she witnesses him being assassinated. Like shot in the head with a, a silenced gun by someone posing as a delivery person, and this delivery person then proceeds to set the office on fire. And Tandy witnesses all of this. Now, by this point in the story, Tandy has met with Officer O'Reilly. Officer O'Reilly, who is investigating the uh, uh, stabbing of the guy uh, who didn't die, that uh, was trying to rape Tandy. And of course, the guy denies that uh, he was trying to rape anybody. He said he was, he was mugged. O'Reilly doesn't believe him. Um, and somehow she zeroes in on Tandy because they found her boyfriend. It's convoluted. The fact that they'd have O'Reilly, who's effectively a homicide detective, checking out what turns out to be basically a, uh, an aggravated assault case. It was really weird. But anyway, at this point in the story, Tandy has the number to this detective. This detective who is sympathetic to Tandy because the detective believes Tandy was a victim of an assault by the guy. Even though they can't prove it, neither one will talk about it because that would expose their individual crimes. Tandy witnesses Greg, the good guy, the good guy trying to do right by her mother, get assassinated she doesn't call the cops. 
She doesn't call O'Reilly. Um, her first concern, once the arson is put out, is to go and make sure that the files in the safe that were the investigative files against Roxanne are still intact, and she takes those. As far as I can tell, Mom never hears that Greg is dead or reacts in any way that he's dead, even though they had a little bit of a spat before uh, he was killed. Um, Greg's death is never avenged or mentioned again, really. The assassin, the, the assassin posing as the delivery person, she shows up again at the end of the show, but Greg's death just kind of happens and Tandy doesn't call the cops. Why? I don't know. Tandy wasn't in any danger of anything. It wasn't like this was like the result of one of her own personal crimes or something. No, she doesn't call the one cop that she can trust to look into the murder of a good guy. She just takes the files and then starts her investigation. Okay, great. Um, there's a point at which Tyrone uh, is present. To, uh, he's hiding. He's hiding in a, in a warehouse, but he sees that the evil cop, Connors, uh, is planning an ambush for O'Reilly because O'Reilly is starting to get close to the truth about Connors and Connors wants to take her out. Um, and so he sets up this ambush for O'Reilly. Tyrone, seeing this going down, who also has O'Reilly's number at this point because he's gone to the police for uh, other things at this stage of the game. It's a long story. Um, he calls O'Reilly's number. He doesn't text her being 15 feet away from the bad guy. He calls her as though he's going to talk to her when he should have texted her, which would be silent and direct and wouldn't have given away his location or his presence and would have warned her before she walked into the warehouse. And of course, when he calls her, she gets the call, but she ignores it. Why? I don't know. Just because. And of course, she walks into the, the ambush, ends up killing a guy. Uh, she, the ambush fails. Uh, depending on how you look at it, either uh, Connors wanted to get O'Reilly killed or he was looking to have O'Reilly kill this other guy uh, in the room with him who um, uh, he was doing crimes with. Depends on how you look at it. Um, we learned through the course of the show that what Roxanne was drilling for on that oil platform wasn't oil, but it was some new kind of energy. They never tell us what this energy is, really. Uh, just that it's more powerful and more valuable than anything else. It's tapped into something really amazing. Uh, it suggested it's something supernatural in some cases, or we don't know. But this is the thing that caused the uh, oil platform to overheat and explode and take the lives of everybody. What does this energy do? Well, it does a couple of things. First, apparently, it gives a pair of seven-year-olds superpowers for some reason. But anyone else who inhales this magical gas that comes out in the explosion turns into a uh, 28 days later uh, rage monster. I mean, they, they turn into effectively crazy people that will attack anyone else on site who also isn't a rage monster. And anyone they physically touch, just have to physically touch, they themselves then become a rage monster. Um, so they're murderous rage, rage monsters who are immediately communicable of their magical rage. They're effectively zombies, you know, but they're not bad people. It's just anybody, an innocent person gets caught in this gas or gets touched by somebody and they suddenly become uh, a, a dangerous individual. I want you to remember that innocent people under the influence of an evil force. Okay. And Tandy and Tyrone know this and learn this while inside the canatonic guy's head, who was on the platform that night and was the only guy to survive somehow. Uh, so they know what this is doing to people and that the people involved are not doing it willfully. I want you to remember this. Now, they, they find this energy. Well, what are they going to do with it? Well, somehow, for some reason, Roxanne builds pipelines for this energy all around New Orleans. Even though it's a secret kind of energy, but they don't understand, no is volatile, to put it mildly, um, and is somehow delivering it to the people of New Orleans, but we don't know how. I mean, if you get natural gas coming into your house, we know the function of natural gas. It's for heat, it's for cooking, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, if it was oil, well, you'd know that. It's for like, you know, refining or whatever. 
but but there's oil pipelines and outlets all over or pump stations all over New Orleans pumping this stuff but we don't know why or to what end or what the market is or how this isn't a publicly known thing of this magical energy just that they can sell it i guess because Roxxon's a corporation they want to make money so they have to sell this thing that they never name and they keep secret i it doesn't doesn't make any sense uh, I talked about how the the victim dad was turned into a wife beater at the end near the end of the show um, in order to completely negate Tandy's entire reason for being, which seemed it seemed like it seemed cruel to me to the character, given everything else that had led up to that point to go through all of that stuff. It seemed cruel. You could still say that there's bad stuff out there for her to solve and everything, but it was, I swear to God, it was a reset button to not let the character advance and to make her go self-destructive again and make her even more unlikable. It was so, so weird. Um, Connors. Okay, bad cop. Cop kills innocent kid. Cop's uncle, who apparently was like the station chief or something at New Orleans Police Department, somehow covers it up, erases Connor's existence, not only from the record, but from anyone's mind who might have ever seen a redheaded cop with a giant scar on his cheek, and is able to go underground in the vice squad for the next 10 or 15 years, however long it's been since that happened. Uh, okay, somehow he does that. Um, he is tricked, more or less, into confessing to the murder and giving details that only he would know, etc., for being at the scene. And this is recorded, and this is passed on to the authorities. But he's never jailed. He gets out, and somehow he now has control over all of the police who, even though he didn't exist, okay? Here's the thing. He didn't exist, prior to this, but now suddenly he's a big figure and everybody knows who he is. What? And uh, O'Reilly, who was present at the confession, um, I'm going a little bit out of order of events here because I'm going to get the other one here real quick, but uh, eventually she's in a bar where Connors shows up and she is so angry at Connors for something else that he's he's done. She goes after him and he beats the shit out of her, okay? He punches her to the floor and beats her fucking bloody in front of a bar full of police officers. No one tries to pull him off of her. No one tries to intervene. All of the police are somehow beholden to this one vice cop who was so protected that he somehow disappeared from being able to be seen or something for the last 10 years. At, but what? It make, makes no sense. Uh, another character who is in this, because everybody has to have some personal tragedy in this thing, O'Reilly has a boyfriend on the force. He's a good guy. He's a nice guy. He's a good cop. He understands the realities of things, but he's a good cop. He helps in the sting to get Connors to confess. Right after this, boyfriend, surprise, surprise, is killed. But not only is he killed, his dead body is stuffed into a fridge. Now, anybody who is a comic book uh, aficionado or knows anything about sort of comic book tropes and things, uh, this is called fridging. It's not a trope because it's only happened once in comic books. It was Green Lantern and uh, uh, Green Lantern's girlfriend was killed and stuffed into a fridge. And this became this weird meme amongst sort of like feminist social justice types who thought that that is the most, uh, that fridging a woman, fridging became, uh, getting fridged is like a woman just becomes a plot point to be murdered for the sake of the hero's story kind of thing. Um, but they'd use this term fridging as though it were something that happened all the time. It only happened really once as far as any significance. But they decided to fridge the cop's boyfriend. So I guess that means now that men have the same complaint in the sexism game in comic books or comic book presentation as women now, I guess. It's not 
a big thing in the sense of the story. It just struck me as kind of like a neener neener from the world of people who take offense to that kind of thing. I just found it really odd. Uh, let's see, talked about Connors beating her up. Um, talk about Tandy erasing people's hopes, turning her into a villain, you know. I mean, she's she's hurting people. She's taking away their hopes. It's the exact opposite of Dagger in the comic books. Dagger is a reluctant vigilante after a fashion, at least a reluctant to cause permanent harm to someone. But Tandy, she's so pissed off that her dad's a wife beater, she's going to destroy other people's dreams too because her dreams got destroyed. Boy, oh boy, that's superhero. Yeah, superhero. <sighs> When the uh, super energy, the super evil energy, finally does erupt around all of these pumping stations around New Orleans, it just happened to be all over the place, uh, all of these innocent civilians suddenly get infected, including the police, with the evil go-crazy virus, and they start attacking people and attacking the city. Um, and at a certain point, O'Reilly, Tandy, and Tyrone are all kind of together uh, having to face off against a crowd of these people. And what do they do to stave off the innocent civilians infected by the evil force? Oh, well, Tandy throws her can cut through anything daggers into their chests, and O'Reilly is up on a sniper position using a high powered rifle to shoot them. I kid you fucking not. Okay? These are not minions of hell coming out of the earth or something. These are innocent civilians who are victims of other forces. And I mean, you could, I mean, you could say, well, O'Reilly was just shooting to wound, or or Tandy was only throwing them at their legs. No, she throws them at their, at their chests. And O'Reilly takes pot shots at them. Now, do we ever see anybody actually die or ever told that there were, like, dead people as a result of this? No. But we're also not told that people were stunned or injured or she was using, like, I don't know, beanbag rounds or something. Right? Maybe I missed something. Maybe I missed something when she pulls out a fucking AR-15 or whatever it was and starts blowing people away. I don't know if an AR-15 can shoot out uh, uh, beanbag rounds. I could be mistaken. Or plastic bullets. Maybe they're plastic bullets. I... Maybe I missed it. Either way, it didn't. It, the, those daggers sure as hell were not plastic rounds. Those things cut through metal. <sighs> and uh, two other things. Throughout this entire show, there is uh, a an element of New Orleans culture embedded in it. Okay, um, and voodoo culture specifically. Uh, there are two characters in, in this that are related to the voodoo aspect. You've got uh, Tyrone's sort of wannabe girlfriend at school, at this prep school he goes to. Um, and then you have her aunt. I believe it's her aunt. And her aunt is sort of like a voodoo priest, priestess. Uh, I, I believe she runs a voodoo shop. I could be mistaken. Um, and the girlfriend gives tours of the voodoo stuff around. Now, I had thought there was going to be a voodoo element to this. Like, there'd be an enemy using voodoo magic at some point. I was thinking that Brother Voodoo would show up. If you know the comic books, you know Brother Voodoo is a character that's sort of in the realm of supernatural stuff and Doctor Strange and kind of... I thought that'd be kind of cool if Brother Voodoo showed up. Or if some other voodoo-based villain became sort of like one of their antagonists. Never happens. Uh, what is the purpose of this character, this voodoo priestess and the whole voodoo thing? I don't know. No idea. It never comes up. She does uh, card readings that sort of like talks about the, the divine pairing as though Cloak and Dagger are some kind of like prophesized or portended team to cleanse New Orleans of its evil or something. Uh, and it's not until the very last episode that after every commercial break, we get a vignette showing, and I don't even know if these are accurate or not, but historical recreations of events in New Orleans history where two people had to uh, fight something and one had to make the sacrifice of their life in order to make sure New Orleans survived. Any Everywhere from the Choctaw Indians all the way up through uh, the Civil War, I think it was the examples they gave. So we get these little historical vignettes 
and, and they have nothing to do with the story. The idea that there was a prophecy about these two, that their powers come from anything other than the Roxxon experiment, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense, has nothing to do with anything. But by the end of the story, or the end of the show, we're told that the two of them will have to face this evil together, and one of them will die. It's happened every time in history previous, and one of them will die. Now, if Tyrone and Tandy were like the latest incarnations of legendary forces like them in the past, like if there had been a a figure, a child of darkness and a child of light in the history of New Orleans for the sake of the Marvel Universe in this show, and they were just the latest iteration that had been brought forth to sort of be the defenders of New Orleans or something, that would have been all right. That would have been kind of cool, but that's not what this is. Because everybody in these vignettes are just normal people, effectively. But we're told one of them's going to die. And so they fight the zombie people. They get to the core somehow of where the energy is being piped out of. Uh, yeah, and it looks like it looks like something out of Star Trek, which, you know, I'm sure the people building it and the whole purpose of having this stuff being pumped out around New Orleans, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but they're both there. They're going to do something to stop this. Um, in one of the vignettes, it was shown that one of the Choctaw Indians uh, of the pair that sacrificed themselves. One had a mark on their arm, a little, little band like a birthmark or a stripe or something. And as they're standing there in the core of the thing, Tandy leans up against this pipe and she gets a burn on her arm that's exactly like the one the Choctaw Indian kid had. Like, oh, she's been marked at this moment, not prior to this in some fashion. Now she's marked, which means she's going to die. Um, except they don't. Neither of them die. They both use their powers, I guess, to funnel the light and the dark mixture of the bad energy straight into the air. You know, the blue light into the sky kind of thing. They funnel this giant cloud of energy into the sky, and then it's all gone. And the city is cleansed, and everybody who was a zombie is no longer a zombie. And, and everything's fine, and they're laying on top of uh, well, the, the Superdome or what, what, whatever that... Um, uh, uh, sports complexes in New Orleans. There's, they, they find themselves teleported to the top of the Superdome. Okay. Um, and, and the problem is solved. Um, except for the fact that Tyrone has been framed for the murder of the cop in the fridge somehow. Uh, and that hasn't been resolved. Connors, the cop that did all of the bad things, has been absorbed into the dark dimension. So he's not even around to be shown to be the bad guy anymore. So now Tyrone's a suspected cop killer. Uh, Tandy is this bitch who is destroying people's uh, dreams and hopes. Uh, they save the city after assaulting and or killing innocent civilians. Um, and now they're both hiding out in a church. At the, the same church that Tandy was hiding in. And... Uh, Oh, and Connors, before he got absorbed into the dark dimension and everything, uh, he, he shot O'Reilly up and kicked her off into uh, the bay uh, after killing her. So O'Reilly's dead. Tyrone's a wanted fugitive. Uh, Tandy is back where, exactly where she started, effectively. She has no money. Um, uh, she, she's poor, still has to be a grifter, I guess. And, and this is where the show ends, except it doesn't end right there because we cut to our after scene. We're out of the swamps, out of the New Orleans swamps. Something crawls out of the bog. And by the coat we see, we know it's O'Reilly. O'Reilly's alive. But then O'Reilly turns to the camera and she's got yellow eyes. And I swear to God, I had thought that suddenly Vincent Price's laugh would start and we'd freeze frame on her face. Because I'm like, you're fucking kidding me. We're ending with a thriller reveal? Yeah, so now O'Reilly's some kind of monster. Even though all of the evil was purged from the city and turned everybody who was a zombie back into normal, somehow her falling into the water off the dock that night made her a permanent monster, I guess. Or something. I don't know. And now we lead into season two. 
I, 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 uh, mm, uh, uh. <sighs> going back to the chat for a couple of minutes here. Uh, uh, Hate Camel says, Choctaw engines, what about my people? I, I don't know what your people are. As far as your avatar tells me, you're a camel that smokes cigarettes. Uh, Midnight Exile says, they can't do a voodoo villain because that would be hate speech against the slaves who originated it. Um, probably cultural appropriation, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Sean M says, would New Orleans be worth saving if all this were true? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I've been down to New Orleans. I've been down a couple times to visit friends. I, I mean, I, I like the ambiance. The French Quarter, it smells bad. <laughs> it sm I mean, I was there on a really hot night. It smelled really bad. Uh, the, the history is really interesting in that place. It has a lot of character. But man, I, as a tourist, you got to be a little careful. Um, what else? Uh, da 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 da. Uh, Blind Press, did this show not understand what genre was supposed to be? Well, that's the thing. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 okay, well, let me back up. The explanation for how Cloak got his cloak, at least until it was ripped to shreds by the end of the show, uh, was actually kind of interesting. It was an interesting uh, uh, um, change to the lore, so to speak. Um, uh, Tyrone's father was part of a... Um, sort of New Orleans uh, based, or, or I should say a ward uh, of New Orleans based uh, private club, community group, brotherhood, uh, the Red Hawks, I think it was called, <clears throat> who like they, they do traditional beadwork and stuff for the uh, Mardi Gras parade and they have their own little like traditions and, and rituals and things. And one of them is you, you sort of like uh, create a different beadwork for different stages in your life. And at the time Billy died, he was making this really elaborate cloak. That's where he got the cloak. And the cloak, you know, kind of looked like the one from the comic books. And it was kind of cool looking. I thought, hey, that's kind of cool. That's a kind of cool way for him to get his cloak. And having the cloak somehow let Tyrone focus his powers and control them better. Uh, why that is, we're never really told. Maybe sentiment, uh, maybe just sort of a, a power object fixation kind of thing. Um but uh, eventually he gets his hoodie back from Tandy at the very end of the show. And I guess that's now his cloak because his actual cloak got ripped up by the zombie people. Seemed kind of a waste. Okay. Uh, and to end this, because I've gone a little bit longer than I meant to. Um, uh, oh, Stargazer Nuts says, are you going to watch season two? Well, here are the things that um, I would like to see them do or change if they're going to do a season two. I believe they are going to do a season two. So, and I want to say something else. When it comes season to season of these shows, I watch them even after the first one disappointed me, let's say, because just like with comic books, you can still appreciate the character and you can see what someone else does with it, either a writer or a director or anything else. Um, even if a season disappoints me, it doesn't make me essentially less likely to want to see the character in action, you know, because if you, if you read uh, Todd McFarlane's run on Spider-Man, uh, you know, if you've got, uh, if you've got Eric Larson doing the art and uh, oh God, I don't even know the, the, the authors anymore, but uh, you know, from, from iteration to iteration of the, of the character, you still love the character, even if a particular run of the comic wasn't the greatest, right? That's how I see these seasons. So even if season one disappointed me, I'll still watch season two because, you know, it, it could improve. And you can sort of, you know, fuzz away some of the bad stuff from the first season if the next season is pretty good, kind of like with the Batman movies. Uh, I wasn't that jazz with Batman Begins, but I could ignore it because Batman... Uh, or sorry, The Dark Knight was great. And it was a standalone kind of thing. I mean, if season two is a standalone deal, sort of setting aside all the origin stuff, fine. Anyway, here's what I would hope for the season two. Uh, cut back on the soap opera. We get it. We get these guys. We get their trauma. We get the fact that they're broken people, etc. We need to see them become heroes. We need to see them work together. We need to see them develop their powers, have more of them exploring the extent of their powers in real space and stop with the psychic stuff. The psychic stuff should be a rare, special sort of event. 
And maybe it should be something that, well, I mean, they've already established that either one can do it at any time, but I thought maybe it should only be something they can do when they're both together at the same time, or the extent of what they can see only comes out when they're both together, something like that. This show needed comic relief, okay? It needed something to take the pressure off, you know? For a show where one of the plot lines is about too much pressure in the pipelines, there's so much uck in 10 episodes, and there's never, ever a moment where you can kind of chuckle, you know? There's rare, I, I, can't even, I can't even remember a moment where I thought that there was a funny exchange or anything. It was all grimdark all the time, all depressing. You need, you need someone or something there to take a little, or, or, or lighten the characters up a little bit somehow. Uh, you need a clear villain. You need, you need a focus. If you have superheroes, you have to have a supervillain. Uh, there was no supervillain in this. Uh, you want to call the force in the pipes the supervillain? Uh, but what is it? You want to call the co the corporation the villain? Y yeah, kind of. You want to call the cop the villain? Well, he kind of became one. He became a supervillain being able to control the entire police department and not have any consequences happen to him and somehow be invisible for the last 10, 15 years or whatever it is. I guess, but anyway. Um and again, make the voodoo stuff relevant. If you're going to imbue the narrative with this, they kept going as an aside to this voodoo priestess. She never had a direct role in anything. We saw her drawing voodoo symbols around the city like she knew something bad was coming and that these two would have something to do with, with curing the city or, or saving the city. But she never did anything. And the entire voodoo thing was no more than sort of a uh, window dressing or a backstory that had nothing to do with nothing. And those vignettes telling us of the history of New Orleans and how a pair of people always came along to save the city. Again, if there'd been some connection like, you know, back in ancient times, they talked of a child of darkness and a child of light. And through them, balance came and the city was saved. So, something like that. And that these two are just the latest manifestation. Okay, that never happened. And, you know, how, how the energy that turned everybody into zombie monsters also turned them into heroes Never explained. Never definitively. Um, so yeah, bring in Brother Voodoo as a hero. If, you don't, if, you, if, it's, if it's too culturally appropriate or villainous to make a, a villain like, a, like make, make our Baron, Baron Zomdi, a Zomdi uh, a villain or something out of it. Just bring in Brother Voodoo as a hero, as a mentor, as a, as a partner, or maybe a spinoff potential. God, a, a Brother Voodoo series would be cool. Man, you just have like a, your, your TV version of uh, Doctor Strange. You know, if you're not going to do Moon Knight, you could do Brother Voodoo. That'd be kind of neat. Probably not, wouldn't do it, but I'd say do it. Um, but yeah, so that is that is my back and forth kind of rambling rant about Cloak and Dagger. Uh, I had high ho hopes for it because I thought Cloak and Dagger were really intriguing characters. The acting was really good. Um, I liked some of the visuals, sort of the, the visual tone of it was all right. Um... I, I, the special effects, for the sake of their powers, was all right. was decent. You know, I kind of liked the look of it. The constant trips to psychic forest land to look into people's fears and dreams and stuff was too much. The soap opera was overwrought. The logic of characters' actions in multiple places made absolutely no sense. Um, the rules for how the powers operated didn't make a lot of sense. Uh taking away Cloak's dark, vengeance-fueled sort of like uh, energy vampire aspect seemed like a wasted opportunity, even if you had to tone it down some, because there was nothing about these characters or their powers that felt symbiotic. You know, the fact that they could both do similar things, okay, but the whole thing about Cloak and Dagger was they needed one another. You know, like without Dagger to occasionally sate Cloak's hunger, Cloak would just go out and start eating people into the darkness. But at least with Dagger around, it keeps him in check to where he's only focusing on the bad people and they're only trying to do good things, even though they're fighting against the temptation to do otherwise. None of that was there. So I'm not quite sure how they build a relationship between these two characters that is as deep, meaningful, and almost sort of addictive after a fashion as the comic books and make it be as sort of, you know, they, they operate 
as two individuals, but they are essentially one force together. That's what made Cloak and Dagger interesting, is that they were essentially permanently inseparable, not only because of their bond to each other as individuals, but also because their powers were so entwined with one another. And the polar opposite, you know? Uh, so yeah, hopefully season two, she's healing people instead of destroying their dreams. Hopefully in season two, uh, Tyrone uh, gives into his dark side a little bit and there has to be some kind of balancing act. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to take a look at the chat real quick one more time before uh, I leave this. Uh, any questions, any comments that I see? Uh, Heroic Nyko, it would be good for a Halloween episode if Cloak and Dagger teamed up with Blade to fight the vampire army alongside Morbius and Black Cat. Well, Sony's making a Morbius standalone movie, so we're not going to see Morbius anytime soon uh, on TV or otherwise. Black Cat, same. Um, anything that is directly Spider-Man universe related, Sony owns the license to almost entirely. So, uh, yeah, anything like that, not going to happen on uh, on Marvel's TV side, unless Sony decides to make a TV show of Morbius, but and then the licensing wouldn't cross over. That's me being a licensing nerd. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Hate Campbell says, I'm Choctaw Scribelite. I had stepped away for a second, came back to hear you talk about Choctaw. Oh, they did a flashback to some lore, and I don't know if it's true or not, or a real legend, about Choctaw Indians in the in the area that would be New Orleans in the future, and how there were two children, and one had to sacrifice their life to bring, um, basically bring back the crops and the fish and make nature, uh, like sacrifice themselves so that everyone else could survive. Again, I don't know if that's a real legend or not. That's what the story presented. Um, let's see, Teddy says, will you be keeping the stream up after you're done? I got here late. Yes, all my review streams are either up or if you're looking for ones that for whatever reason I might have archived, I have a playlist on my channel called Reviews and everything from these uh, rants to the movies, movies you should have watched that I do with Monkey are on there. Uh, thank you, Ragnar Ulfbert. Lots of sex scenes to have to save second season. I, you know, I was kind of surprised for a show from ABC on TV uh, how how often they used uh, the word shit, and how many times they showed not not explicit, but they showed people having sex. Uh, there was no nudity per se, uh, just like you know you saw the motions and people sort of like half clothed or whatever. Uh, I, but I was I was I was actually kind of surprised by that for an ABC affiliated show. Uh, so I guess Freeform is kind of Netflix light uh, for ABC, or they're dabbling in that kind of format. Uh, Stargazer Nut says, thanks for the stream, Scribelite. You guys are welcome. Um, uh, Midnight Exile says, so what happened with showrunner Joe Pakaksky? I don't even know how it says. Did his talent just drive? Well, well, he wrote the first two episodes and the last episode. Um, the first two episodes, again, were the strongest part of the whole series that sort of set up the origin story. The last episode had to somehow wrap everything up, and it was a clusterfuck. So I don't know if he was painted into a corner by the uh, actions of the other writers or something, but uh, you take the first two episodes and set alongside the last episode, and I, I, I was surprised to find out the same person wrote both because they are so drastically different in quality and tone from one another. Uh, the first two are relatively well presented and constructed. The last one is just sort of like a Brady Bunch ending. Let's wrap everything up real quick. And sure, let's just shoot the civilians. Like what? Anyway. Um, okay. Uh, Dectran says, do you have FX scribe? No, I, I don't have actual TV or cable. Uh, everything that I see is off of uh, uh, YouTube or Netflix or Hulu as far as things go, or you know what the news will stream, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, guys, that is my uh, rant review of Cloak and Dagger. Uh, if you are a Marvel TV or, or uh, entertainment diehard fan, uh, I suggest you watch it just to know what's going on, because there may be crossovers in the future, given what they the names they dropped in this one. Uh, or if you're going to watch it, at the very least, watch the, the first two episodes, maybe the third um, if you just want to get a little bit of a taste of what could have been if they continued with that kind of stuff in the first couple episodes. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you decide to sit through all 10 episodes, well, uh, you know, I'd be interested to see what you think. Leave your comments in the comments below on that if you do. Uh, but otherwise, guys, 
Thanks again for watching and listening, and uh, I will see you all on Lords of the Night. And otherwise, have a good night, guys. Bye-bye.